Hi guys. I can see, okay. I've got a few people here already. Um, I am just going to kind of warm up and introduce everybody. If you're watching this live, you can stay with me and I'll take you through the instructions. And if you are watching this recorded and you're watching it later, then I'd advise you, you can start the video at about two minutes because that's when we'll start to get into the meat of the tasting. Um, hi, Tanya. How are you? How's your concert at Red Rocks? Looks amazing. Tanya was at Lionel Richie. Looked pretty exciting. I would love to see him live. <laughs> hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Yay. I love it when my mom's here. Great. Oh, Tanya's got friends. So I love this, guys. I love it when people have um, groups of people with them. They have like a party at their house or whatever. And um, I think this is a really fun thing to do. And what I will tell you is that I've learned now from doing a few of these when there are groups of people. So if you've got a party of people over at your house, sometimes you guys will get to talking or whatever, and you will miss maybe some of my cues to taste the wine or do whatever. So one thing you can always do is you can pause it. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can pause the video and um, have your chat or whatever and come back to it whenever you're ready. So uh, I hope you see my message. If you forgot to chill your wine, go stick it in the fridge or a better thing would be to stick it in an ice bucket or something in the freezer right now. Um, I'm going to, since we have a bottle of sparkling wine to open, our cava, I am going to show you how I open a bottle of sparkling wine. For one thing, you can, uh, if you haven't opened it already, if you guys have already opened it, then wonderful, please start drinking. But for those of you, I know people can always use a little refresher on how to open a bottle of sparkling wine. So what you do is you take off the, um, what's that called? I don't know, the foil, right? Um, but you don't want to take off the cage. I see people do this a lot of times where, you know, you have the little metal cage here and there's the loop to start undoing it. Um, you don't want to take it off of the bottle because there's a lot of pressure in these bottles of sparkling wine and you can get a black eye from doing that or do something else. So what I do is I um, unhook it, I loosen it, but I don't actually take it off. I keep my finger on it at all times. I always keep something on it. And then I just kind of turn the bottle and... <laughs> I guess this is what I get for trying to do this live, but um, usually you could have a towel or whatever. That'll also help you to make sure that you don't lose the cork and it doesn't fly across the room. But if you've got the cage on it, that'll do pretty well too. So there you go. Cheers. I've opened my bottle of bubbly. Hope you, hopefully you guys have popped your corks too. Um, we're drinking this really awesome kava that I'm in love with and I'll tell you more about it. So grab your glasses if you don't already have those. Have at least one glass per person, uh, or I guess you can share. Originally, I was calling this a kava date night, and so I thought, okay, if people wanted to, you know, use this as a date night in or something like that, you could do that. But then I thought, mm, I'll just make it a kava night, and people can choose to do it at what you want. So I actually have two glasses, um, not for my date because he's putting the kids to bed. But I am tasting out of both a champagne flute and out of my glass of wine. And I'm doing this because um, it's like a little experiment. But people always think you have to have a champagne flute or special champagne glasses in order to drink your sparkling wine or your champagne. Um, but I actually usually end up just drinking mine out of a regular wine glass. And so if you have both at home, maybe you want to grab both and you can do a little experiment and taste it out of both and see which one you prefer. I'll tell you, well, first of all, cheers. <laughs> I'll do a toast with myself. Um, cheers and go ahead and sip your wine and enjoy it. Delicious. Um, by the way, use the chat on this, especially if you're on YouTube. Let me know as you guys are tasting the wine, what you think of it, what you notice about it. If you like it, if you don't like it, that's okay too. Um, all kinds of comments. This is one of the fun things is when people who are in different places in the world and everything are all chatting together and you guys are swapping stories and getting to know each other too. It can be a social wine tasting. And if you're watching on Facebook, I don't know if you guys can chat on there too. Maybe you can. I'll have to investigate that. <laughs> so back to the glasses. I've got two different kinds of glasses that I am, okay, somebody gives me a thumbs up. So I think that means that you can do that. You have two, I have two different kinds of glasses. 
I have my typical champagne flute. And the benefits of drinking your sparkling wine out of a champagne flute is that because it's a little bit narrower, it keeps the wine colder and it also keeps the bubbles in it longer. So there's that. The downside of it for me is that the opening at the top isn't quite as big. So I don't really have as much space to swirl the wine, to smell it, and to get as much aromas out of the wine uh, as I do when I drink out of this glass. And I like to, even though you do lose some of the bubbles when you swirl it, I still really like to swirl my wine so that I can smell it so much better because when you introduce oxygen to the wine, it volatizes the esters or the smelling compounds. It makes them more intense and you're able to smell them much better. So go ahead, maybe smell your wine just without swirling your glass and then go ahead and do a little bit of swirling and you're gonna see it's just, it's a whole other ball game. The wine just comes alive and you can smell so much more in it even before we start trying to identify and talk about what I specific, specifically smell, um, you'll just notice that there's a difference there. So for me, I like drinking my uh, sparkling wine out of regular wine glasses. And the other reason I also like to drink it out of regular wine glasses is if then I'm going to move on to a red wine or something like that, I have fewer glasses to wash because I'll just use the same glass and I'll drink my red wine or whatever I'm going to have after that um, in the same glass. I don't know. I guess I should know better after all these years of working in the wine business, but I'm lazy and I don't like watching too many glasses. So this is our fabulous cava of the night. I'm going to show it to the folks who are on Facebook and on YouTube. Oh, that's funny. It, uh, I don't know if you guys see the mirror image of it or if you actually see it, but it's the Juve and Camps. I don't actually know how to speak Spanish very well, but it's their Reserva de la Familia Brut Nature Gran Reserva Cava. So there's a lot of words on there and we're going to decode the label and all the aspects of it so you guys will understand how to read a label of cava. But I thought before then, I'll just give you a brief introduction of what cava is. Um, kava, the word itself kind of refers to the caves because sparkling wine and champagne are often aged in caves. So this is kind of speaks to the, the way the wines are made. And it's the name for sparkling wines made in Spain. And they can be usually from anywhere in the country of Spain, as long as they're following the rules and guidelines for how cava has to be made. But a lot of it comes from the Penedes region, um, which is kind of a higher altitude place, which is important because it's a cooler weather region for you to be able to um, get a lot of that nice acidity from the grapes so they don't get super, super ripe. That's what makes for really good sparkling wine grapes. So cava is sparkling wine from Spain. <laughs> and the really cool thing about it and the reason I chose it is because it is made in what's called the method champenoise or the, the method that champagne is made. And we'll talk more about that. But it's made in the same way, but usually it's about half the price or even less. Uh, I don't know how much you guys bought this wine for where you live, but I was able to buy it for less than $20. I think it was like uh, 18 where I was. By the way, add it in the chat how much you paid for it because it'll be interesting to see how much it is around the country. I know Tanya's joining from Colorado. My mom's in Ohio, so I don't know how much you guys paid there. But um, you can have a wine that has a lot of the same similarities as champagne. I won't call it the same. Uh, and a champagne, entry-level champagne is going to cost you at least $30. And really when you get into the, some of the more interesting ones, you're getting into $50, $60 champagne. So I think this is just such a steal and more people should know about and drink cava. <laughs> the other things I like about cava um, is that it, it really makes for fantastic cocktails for anybody who likes, oh, awesome. My mom paid $12. There you go. The benefits of living in Ohio. And um it makes for really good cocktails. So I have a summertime kind of um, lemon sorbet cocktail that I make that I top off with cava. And in the wintertime or in the fall, I do it with like a warmed apple cider. And if you guys want, I can send you the recipes for those. But um, cava, because it's less expensive, I don't feel bad using it in my cocktails. And the other thing is that it's such a great wine for food. 
which brings me to the other thing that I asked you if you're on my mailing list and you um, know about this tasting and what to buy for the tasting. I told you to buy some Manchego cheese. I'm not tasting the cheese today because I'm off dairy for a little bit, but uh, if you have the Manchego cheese, you can go ahead and just start nibbling on it throughout at any point in time. And what I'd say is just notice how one of the things I like about Manchego is um, the kind of rich nuttiness of the cheese and also, of course, the saltiness. And that is such a great contrast to the bright, zippy, puckering acidity of the cava and the um, kind of stone fruits and a lot of the tones that you'll get in, in the cava. But then you'll also get some similarities because kava is also known for some of its nuttiness that you're probably getting in this. And there's also a kind of nuttiness in the Manchego cheese. So there's both some contrasting flavors there and also some similarities. I'm going to pause for a second because I'm talking a lot. Uh, And I want you guys to know that one of the benefits of doing these live tastings is that it's interactive. It's meant to be two ways. So feel free at any point to ask any of your questions. If I mention a word or a term that doesn't make any sense if you don't know what I'm talking about, or if you're even like, wait a second, where are we in this whole thing? Then um, just let me know at any point and I'll slow down or I will answer your questions. Did anybody, did anybody have the two different kinds of glasses and you guys taste them out of both? I'm kind of interested to see if you had a preference for which one it was. See, this is funny. They taste, they smell different. So really, you guys, some people might prefer it in the traditional champagne flute. And if you have a different kind of glass, if you have, I don't know, even a plastic cup or a jam jar or whatever, good for you. Fine. As long as it does the trick. (laughs) Okay. So by the way, the other thing that you may have noticed while I was pouring sparkling wine, I'll give you a little sommelier's tip, is that when you're pouring, pouring bubbly wine, Uh, one of the tricks is to make sure it doesn't overflow in the glass. And one of the ways that I do that is I pour just a teeny tiny little bit in everybody's glass and I go around and I pour it in the glasses. And then once the bubbles settle down, you can go back and you can top off the glass and pour up to the top of the glass easily and it won't overflow because the bubbles have kind of already settled down in that initial pour. So that's a little trick that I wanted to share with you guys. Okay, so back to kava. As I mentioned, it's made in the same way as champagne. What that means is actually a really cool process because unlike, okay, you guys, Tanya has a six-month and a 12-month aged manchego plus quince paste. What the heck is quince? (laughs) I don't know. It's a fruit. Quince is a fruit. Um, And it makes a really, really, um, it's a gelatinous fruit, and it makes for a really, really lovely kind of jam um, that is awesome when you put it on manchego. And it's just like such a classic thing that you would have in Spain. So I'm excited that you guys have that really yummy. And maybe you'll even get some of those fruit flavors in the wine too. So uh, I was mentioning how cava is made, how champagne is made too. What they do is just like any other wine, you crush the grapes and you get the, the grape juice and you ferment that and you make it into wine. You add some yeast to it and all the sugar turns into alcohol. Beautiful, magical thing. Then what they do, you end up with like a still wine, a regular wine. Then they take that still wine, they add in a little bit more yeast along with some sugary grape juice, and then they put the cork in it and they stick it in the cellar. And what happens is what's called a secondary fermentation. So you already had your first fermentation that created the alcohol and turned the grape juice into wine. Now the second fermentation is going to release bubbles. And because you have a cork on that bottle, all of those bubbles are going to stay in the bottle. And guess what? They get transformed and they come into the wine. So the really cool thing is then the wine is aged Um, one of the things that fall out from that process when the the yeast uh, cells die, they turn into what's called the lees of the wine. 
And that leaves the sediment of the yeast kind of come in contact with the wine over many, many months. And this is when they keep them in the, the caves, those dark champagne caves. If you've ever been to Champagne, it's a really cool place to visit and go um, do your wine tourism because you can go down in the caves and see all these bottles that have been aging for a long time. Um, and this cava was aged for an average of 36 months. So that's a long time that they've kept the wine in contact with those lees. And that's what gives it, if you guys can smell the wine, you can smell like some of those nutty, um, buttery, even caramel tones to it. All of those, or even biscuit kind of flavor, all of those smells in the wine come from that process of the wine aging on the lees in those cellars for all that time. So this is something that you won't get in a cheap bottle of cold duck or Andre, if they sell, sell that, uh, because those are made the same way soda is. They just add carbon dioxide to the wines and that's how it gets its bubbles. So you won't get any of these really lovely flavors that come from that secondary fermentation and also all of the aging of the wine. Oh, so good. I hope you guys are enjoying that. So, okay, by the way, I'm not hearing from other people chatting and talking, but I see that you're there. So I'll say hello to you. If you if you want to, feel free to say hello, say who you are, say where you're um, watching from. But if not, if you'd rather just watch incognito, feel free to do that too. So my mom says that I couldn't find Manchego, so we are eating white cheddar with jalapeno. Oh, and it's very good. Okay, awesome. I wouldn't have guessed that the, um, the spiciness of the jalapeno and that greenness of the jalapeno, I wouldn't have known that that matches, but I'm so glad it does. That's really cool. And actually, this is one of the best things about kava is I, I have yet to find a wine and food pairing that doesn't work with kava. In fact, I had kava both for the Halloween candy wine tasting that I did last year at Halloween. And I also had it in my chocolate and wine tasting. And both times, it was the most versatile of all the wines that I was trying to pair with the chocolates and the candies and things like that. So like really, truly, I mean it when I say this is food friendly. Okay, so look at my notes and tell you um, what else there is to know. Oh, I was going to tell you about this particular winery. This winery, I chose it, um, well, one, because I love the taste of the wine. But the other reason I chose it is because, uh, oh, Luis Diego watching from Costa Rica. Hello. Yay. See, I told you people are here from all over the world. <laughs> and um, this winery in Spain, in the Penedes region, is uh, for fourth generation of winemakers on this property. So it's really cool, I think, when that happens because mm, winemaking, when you do the winemaking, it is such an art and a skill of knowing the fruit, the raw materials that are coming in. So it's kind of like a chef. If, you, if you're making a tomato sauce or whatever, you need to taste those tomatoes first to know kind of like how to make the tomato sauce, like how to adjust for it. If your tomatoes are really ripe and really sweet, maybe you don't add any sugar. If they're not, you, you know, you make these adjustments. So this family has all of this know-how that they pass down for generation to generation for 200 years now. They've been farming this piece of land and making these wines from there. So I think, you know, that's where you get, and it's incredible if you think about that, 200 years of winemaking, 36 months uh, spent in the cellar on the lees, all of this know-how and great, great juice shipped all the way from Spain, and we get to drink it for less than $20. I mean, that to me is just like a miracle, basically. I think it's so cool. So um, what else to tell you about this winery? Oh, the grapes that are used. I don't know if anybody cares about this, but it used to be that people always would ask me, like, Badini, what is the wine? What what are the grapes, right? Because we're so used to California wine always saying what the grape variety is. Well, you know, in Europe, they don't always tell us what the grapes are. Okay, so grapes, grapes, grapes. Okay, somebody's spamming the chat. Uh, I don't know how to stop that, but sorry, ignore all that. So what you'll see is that the, um, the grapes in cava are uh, Zarello. They're grapes you've kind of never heard of. Zarello, Periada, um, 
<laughs> okay, I must be getting big because somebody's spamming the chat. I guess that means that you've finally been uh, seen. <laughs> so Pari Pariata, Zarello, and Maccabeo uh, are three of the grape varieties that nobody really hears about. And then uh, Chardonnay also, typically. There isn't Chardonnay in this wine in particular, but Chardonnay is one of the grape varieties used to make champagne. Oh my gosh, I don't know how to stop all the spamming. Um, and so, bummer. Don't know how to do that, how to stop all the spamming on here. Well, for next time, I will figure out how to stop all the spammers. This is a great braid. <laughs> this is good. We will sup. Okay, amazing. I love it. Um, then <laughs> grapes will roll. So, oh, I was going to tell you the percentages of this actual wine. So there is no Chardonnay in this wine, but a lot of times you will find in Cava that they are adding ch ch Chardonnay in, especially in some of the higher end Cavas, um, because they've learned that from the Champagne region too. Uh, so this one is 55% Zarello, that's spelled with an X, and it is, um, you'll pick up the Zarello from a lot of the citrus notes and maybe some of the apple that you're smelling in the wine, especially some of that golden apple. And then there is Macabeo. The Macabeo is going to give you some of the stone fruits and the like slightly floral tones in the wine. And then there's the Periada uh, and... Luis Diego, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so you can correct my Spanish. But the Periada is um, is going to give you a lot of that mouthfeel, kind of in the middle of the wine. We wine tasters call it the mid palate. But you sip the wine, you first get an initial attack, then you get your mid palate, and then you get the finish. So in the mid palate, there's that kind of richness, that body, that weight in your mouth that's unlike water. It's like heavier than water. And that is coming from your Periada. So... Those are the grape varieties of this wine. Not that you would ever need to know that. Not that you will probably ever see those grape varieties in other places, but just kind of fun fact to know since we're tasting cava. And don't forget to keep um, tasting your cheese if you guys have the manchego and going back and forth to the wine and the cheese or any of the other foods that you have because that's one of the fun things to check out. Okay. So uh, at this point, I'm going to tell you guys that if you're watching, it's a really good moment to pause, take a picture of yourself, take a picture of your wine, take a picture of the loved one you're with, whatever, um, and post it to Instagram and tag me if you wouldn't mind. My handle there is Dini Vino Graham, Dini Vino Graham. And I would love it if you post a story or if you post something on Instagram and you tag me and you say you're doing a virtual wine tasting or a remote wine tasting. Because remember, this is really revolutionary stuff. Not a lot of people know about online remote wine tastings. This is a new thing. Um, and I would love to spread the word and get more people to know about it. Okay. All right. So uh, I told you I was going to tell you more of all of these crazy things that are on the label. So we talked about the producer, who Van Comps. There is the uh, vintage 2015, which is the year when the grapes were ripened. Then the other thing to know about this is that it's called Brut Nature. So there's all different levels of sparkling wines, all different levels of champagne, and all different levels of cava when it comes to sweetness. So this is really nice because they go ahead and they tell you on the label that this is a Brut Nature. And Brut Nature, Brut Nature, you could call it, um, because that's the way it's spelled, is the driest of all the levels of cava. So you're going to have like Brut Nature, then Brut, then you're going to have like... Um, I don't even remember what the other ones are called in Cava, but, you know, they'll be like a, a semi-dry and a um, off-dry and things like that. And they'll all be different levels of sweetness. I'm going to look up and send you guys afterwards. Goodbye. Oh, thank you so much. Random falling stuff. <laughs> um, I'm going to send you guys all of the, the, the specifics. So you'll have that. Um, and then the other thing that's on here is that it's a Gran Reserva. And the cool thing about the European winemaking countries is they actually, when they put that on a label, they um, 
they have strict guidelines for what that means. So not anybody can just put Gran Reserva. The Gran Reserva means that it has been aged a minimum amount of time for 30 months, I believe it is. And that's why, you know, this one is an average of 36 months in bottle. So this is one of the reasons they're able to qualify for that higher status um, versus a Reserva versus a regular Cava. So that's kind of the, the hierarchy there. So again, pretty cool that you're able to get like the very top level of kava for $18 or $15, depending on where you are. Okay. So still feel free to keep your questions rolling in if you guys have any questions. Um, but I only have a five minutes left of this tasting. So I did want to make sure that I go over another thing. I did a whole video on my YouTube channel about how to tell the difference between kind of like an average sparkling wine and a champagne, like a high quality champagne. And so I thought I'd talk about a little bit about that here because I always say like, oh, I picked a really good one. And um, there are two different things when it comes to wine. For one thing, there is your own personal taste and whether or not you are going to like something. And that you know, I can't necessarily predict without knowing each of your individual taste. And when I work with people and I consult them or I make recommendations on their wines, the first question I always ask people is like, well, what do you like? And by the way, any good wine store, any good sommelier should also ask you that before they give you a recommendation to get a sense for your taste because we're all different. We all have our own personal taste. The other thing is that there is objective quality levels when it comes to wine. And professional wine tasters, when we all taste, there are criteria, there's actual grids that we use in order to say what quality level the wine is. Um, and so I thought I'd go over some of the things that help me see the high quality uh, nature of this wine that I think make it a Grand Reserva, that actually make it taste like a Grand Reserva, that higher quality level. For one thing, I pay attention to the bubbles. People always talk about the bubbles when it comes to sparkling wine, right? And the bubbles in this are really nice because they're so integrated in the wine. And what I mean when I say that is that they're they're small, they're part of the wine. They're not, again, if you guys can think to having a, a can of soda, or maybe if you've had Andre or um, Cold Duck, some of the cheaper sparkling wines, they're very different in your mouth. The bubbles are like kind of taking over or beer or something like that. It's all about the bubbles. Whereas if in here, it's kind of about the wine and the bubbles are just kind of part of it. They're part of the mouthfeel of it, which I think is really cool. Um, so I call that the finesse of the wine, the finesse of the bubbles. And if you sip that and you taste it, you can kind of just get that integration of the bubbles in the wine. The other thing, um, so I was going to talk about the finesse, the complexity, and the length. So when it comes to complexity, again, if you have a very low quality wine, you are going to taste like one thing and it's going to hit you over the head. If you've got a bottle of lingerie, it's going to like hit you over the head like grape juice. It's just like, whoa, that's grape juice. And it's like really strong and has that one kind of flavor to it. This, on the other hand, is different. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but as you're trying to smell it and taste it and describe it, there's a lot of different notes to it. You know, we talked about the apple tones, biscuity, nutty, caramel, um, stone fruits, even maybe a honey scent to it, uh, buttery. These are all descriptors that I could come up with to describe this one. So I would say that's complex. There's a lot there to it. So that's another sign of quality level in a wine. So we've got the finesse, we've got the complexity, and then the length can be another hint. Now, any one of these things in and of itself, so let's say you had a really long wine, um, that by itself doesn't necessarily mean it's a high quality wine because there might be other factors going on. It might be a really long, unpleasant finish in the wine. So that might not you know, qualify as, as high quality, but all these things together kind of make up the high quality. And do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say length? Right in the chat, yes, if you know what I'm talking about. But if not, I'm going to describe it because it, it's a little bit obvious, but it's how long the flavor of the wine persists in your mouth after you've swallowed the wine. 
So if you go ahead and you take a sip of this wine, you taste it. And then it kind of stays with you. It doesn't stay with you an awfully long time. Like if you had one of the $60, $70 champagnes, you would probably taste this wine uh, for longer. But it does kind of linger and stay with you for, I don't know, maybe three, five plus seconds. Uh, And I think that's a good sign of its quality. So these are some of the factors. There's a lot of things that go into quality. You could talk about balance. You could talk about intensity of the flavors of wine. Um, A lot of other descriptors when we come to overall quality, but these are just some of the things that I look at when I'm trying to figure out what quality level a wine is. And when I'm doing those blind tastings, I'm trying to take a guess at what price point this wine might be. And those are some of the clues that, um, that I might find in the glass. So we are, our time is up. If anybody has any lingering last questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, if not, let me make sure I scroll down all the way in the chat. If not, I will leave you to enjoy the rest of your bottle of kava. Cheers. Enjoy. And thank you guys so much for joining me. It really means a lot to me that you're out there and you're joining these and enjoying these. Um, It's super, super fun for me. I think it's so cool that I'm able to um, have dinner with my kids, put my kids to bed and get to do a wine tasting in a night. So I hope we'll get to do many more of these. And if you really enjoy these, please share my website, Life in Vino, with your friends so that they can get on my mailing list and get invited to the next ones. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Oh, I am sure I want to end it. Yes.